I'm Suzanne David Sand, Executive Director of the Chamber Music Society, and I just wanted to come welcome you back. I'm so happy to see everyone back, all the new people, and it's fabulous to have everyone back for the first day of school. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very happy day. The Senate has voted not to shut down the government. We've got till December 11th, so that's a good start. The Pope was here, which was very nice, and he has left, which is a little bit nicer. <laughs> and the UN is about to end, so it's a perfect time for us to start. This is actually the start of the CMS season. So we had a fabulous, for those who were not able to be there, a fabulous July series, the summer series. We were sold out for every concert. There were returns lines for every concert. So we thank everyone who was there and are looking forward to, this is now what we're going to do. We'll be here in July in the summer. So uh, after that, we were at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center, which was great also, but the best is to be back here. So thrilled to be starting, obviously. Bruce Adolph is back, and then it's a wonderful night to be able to introduce the Calador Quartet, who are going to be starting as CMS2 next season. So you're getting not only the first concert of the season, but also a preview on this new fabulous ensemble. So welcome, looking forward to a great season together. Thanks for being here. So, <laughs> yes, what does it mean to be sincere? Oh, I do hear that. Um, first, a few quotes from Foray himself so you would get the idea of what I mean by sincerity. While actually working on this piece, the piano quintet in D minor that you're going to hear, he said, so often the point where we are or, or the one we are aiming for is untranslatable. How many times have I asked myself, what is music for? What feelings, what ideas, how can I express something of which I myself can give no account? Yet, isn't it often that something external that lulls us into thoughts of a sort so imprecise that they are not thoughts, and yet they are something in which we take pleasure, the desire for non-existent things, perhaps, and that is the domain of music. You're right to value chamber music as you do. I didn't know you were going to be here. It is the sincerest translation of personality. Then he also says, isn't every artist free to translate his thought, his sensibility by the means it pleases him to choose? <clears throat> Another foray quote, to express what you have within you with sincerity is the clearest and most perfect terms possible. This is from the French, you know, so that's why it's a little hard to understand. The most perfect terms possible would always seem to me the summit of art. Then he says, but that's so simple, it almost seems foolish. I've, he wrote in a letter, he didn't like talking. Um, this, there were five books written in Foray's lifetime about sincerity in art. And the idea that you translate your soul sincerely in your music is really significant. Now, before I do anything about this quintet, I would like to play just a little bit of a, probably his most famous song, Après un rêve, After a Dream. Just a few, it's, I, I tell you now, I'm going to turn it off pretty quickly into it, so don't be alarmed. This is Gérard Suzet, so don't criticize his French, you'll be wrong. He's very good. <clears throat> Whoa. Whoa, sorry. 
Here we go. That's all you're going to hear of that. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, right there, though, if I play that again for you on the piano and then change it a little bit, it explains a great deal. What we heard was this, in a different key. first chord that we land on the big one, dolls and so may. If I put this back to a simple minor key without all this foray-ism happening, this is what's underneath it. This is the simple like folk-like music that's underneath. That, that's really the simplified version of it. Just two chords. That's all I was playing. But what Foray does is not this, but this. And this sums up who he is. And then, I did it again. <laughs> okay, now, this is very emotional music. It's 19th century music. It's romantic music, but it's also personal. He's translating his soul. So we have to get to know his soul. He's not just imitating people. So I want to look at what was his life like a little bit that made his music this way, but also what was his education like? Because without the education that Foray got, he wouldn't have been able to do this. He was not educated at the Paris Conservatory like most people at his time. And he was not educated at the other big school, the Schola Cantorum. He, he became, in the same year that he wrote this piano quintet, he became the director of the Paris Conservatory, 1905. It was the same year that France separated church and state. It's still in the news today, at least here it is. But there, that separation was very important for musicians because the um, Dreyfus case was still pounding in people's ears. And the Schola Cantorum, <coughs> the other big music school, believed that all music was a manifestation of Christian theology and that all music taught moral lessons. So if you went to that school, you learned that. And the conservatoire didn't believe things like that at all. They were completely free. But until Foray got there, it was so loosey-goosey that actually people didn't learn much there. So either you were deeply indoctrinated in something that was actually fairly right-wing, and was called anti-Dreyfus art, or you were in a school where you only learned major and minor scales, you didn't learn much history, and you learned some four-part writing, and then you were told to go make a living. Where did he study? Well, before I tell you, and I'll tell you what he learned, too, because he learned music differently than we all learned it, and I hope we start learning it this way again. Uh, his life, after he graduated from the school that I'll mention eventually, uh, was very emotionally complex. By age 31, he decided he needed to be married and he had fallen in love with the daughter of Pauline Viardot. Pauline Garcia Viardot was one of the most famous opera singers in France and in Europe. And also she was a well-known composer and a pianist, a friend of Chopin, all these people. She was a very important figure. Her daughter, well, apparently not quite as amazing as the mother, but anyway, he was in love with her which uh, led to his proposing. And she, at age 17, when he was 31, was terrified of the idea of marriage. She'd never been out of the house. He had almost never been home. So it was basically, it didn't work. She said no. And he went into a tremendous depression. 
and he didn't function very well. He, his friends and family decided to arrange a marriage for him. To, they thought that would fix everything up. And I'm not kidding you, they gave him three families that began with the letter F, the last name. And they chose Frumier because the father was a famous sculptor, so the genetics, which they didn't know anything about, were good. <laughs> Maybe subliminally. They, but um, but it, it was a terrible marriage. They had two kids. She wouldn't let those kids, as they grew up, ever go out of the house because of germs. Uh, they were homeschooled, so they would never get sick. Um, they actually grew up to be pretty interesting people. But meanwhile, Faure had many, many affairs, many, many. He was very famous for this throughout France. And in France at that time, and possibly now, it was okay. <laughs> in fact, it only helped his reputation. And he was, through it all, sincere. Now, <clears throat> almost all of the songs that he's, a huge percentage of the poetry uh, of, of Faure that he said are about unrequited love or more often, Love that was short, too brief, for some reason. Now, uh, where did he go to school? His parents were not musicians, but he was discovered to be very musically talented. The story is told over and over by an old blind woman who was probably middle-aged, but you know, it's always an old blind woman. Uh, and she told the family that he's incredibly talented, and they decided to do the right thing, and they sent him away from age 11 to 20. <clears throat> to a boarding school in, where he could study music because there was no place nearby. So from age 11 to 20, unlike Marianne Viardot, who was home, he was not home. And when he was not home, he was studying in one of the most progressive, musically speaking, just musically, progressive-minded places uh, in, in all of France. He learned a different kind of harmony. And that harmony is what he learned and incorporated and put into his music in a way that nobody else who went to that school did. Because there was another famous person there, his teacher, only a few years older than he was, for after a while was uh, Camille Saint-Saëns, or Saint-Saëns, depending if you say it right or wrong. Um, and um, basically, Faure was one of the only promising students who turned into something great, and so this whole method of composition, which I'm going to explain it to you, and it really is unusual, comes to fruition in Faure, who becomes then the head of the conservatoire and a very important teacher, and teaches Debussy, and Ravel, and Florent Schmitt, and many other important people. And even he, Faure, lived long enough to sign the um, diploma for Edgar Varese. If you think about it, it's kind of amazing. So. The school was called, eventually called the Niedermeyer School, after Niedermeyer, who founded the school. Before that, it was just called, uh, it was a school of religion and music, but it wasn't like the Schola Cantorum. The idea was to train the students to be organists and choir masters, which Faure became. So, what does that mean? What's different? What's different is that Niedermeyer used a text by uh, a man named Lefebvre, and this harmony text had a different view of harmony. So let's, even, even if you haven't studied harmony, this is going to make perfect sense. Here's a major scale. Normally, you go up the scale with notes forming chords from that scale. And any note that is not from the scale refers to another key. That refers to another key. Well, Lefebvre did not go along with that. He didn't say that wasn't true, but that was limiting. He felt that every form of harmony that is a variation or, or an alternative is possible without changing key. So for example, take the scale. Instead of just this, these were all C chords. One, the minor is okay, the augmented is okay, the diminished is okay, the major seventh, the dominant, the ninth, even such things as uh, bizarre things like all of these were considered just chords on the note C. So that a student at that school might play a, harmonize a, in fact, I'm looking right at, these are pages from the original. I'm not kidding you. You, uh, you might not be surprised to learn that you can find the entire treatise online. It's, it's, there's one copy left, somebody photographed it and put it up online. 
Um, so you can read it. It's in French, but the music's in music. <laughs> <coughs> this is the Alteration de la Médian des Accords de Neuvième. What does that mean? No, it, it means that uh, if you take a ninth chord, a ninth chord is this. There's a note, one, three, five, seven, nine. That's all a ninth chord is. So if anyone asks, you go, <laughs> chord, one, three, five, seven. <laughs> okay, but it means that you can lower the third. And here's, you could also, on this one, raise it. In other words, you can alter these chords. Any permutation you like is okay. Nobody was doing this. So here's a scale from this book. I'll put the bass down here. That's, that's the harmony he was learning. Isn't that extraordinary? If, if you don't think so, you can leave now. Because <laughs> no, it's really, really amazing because uh, it opened a whole world. Lots of people were taking classes and, you know, they probably weren't paying attention. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were, they were sitting there, they were being taught the most extraordinary way of harmonizing music in all of Europe at that time, the most advanced thing. And, you know, maybe they're going, yeah, homework, yeah, I gotta do this, you know. But, but Foray took it, he learned it. Here's some more things from there, <clears throat> from this book. And then we'll get into the piece. Oh, well, I took happy birthday since you probably heard the news that happy birthday is no longer copyrighted. <laughs> oh, what a relief. <laughs> I can't believe it. Okay, so here's happy birthday harmonized as it might be harmonized in the 4A school, or the Niedermeyer school. And what I've done <clears throat> is make a chromatic bass line. A chromatic bass line means every note sharp and flat on the way up. Because that, that kind of thing would be an assignment in this school. Not with happy birthday, but here we go. Now, um, <clears throat> anyway, so that, that's basically what he was learning, although they didn't do happy birthday. But here is one more thing from that book, because I'm just amazed that this harmony book was used. It says that you can do this, but you can also lower a note if you want. This is an exercise from the book. Some of them are more ordinary than others. So the exercises he grew up with led naturally to him having something that expressed by its very nature, by the style of the music, instability, right? It's not stable. You can move in any direction harmonically. You can wander, you can roam anywhere you want with no problem. It's okay to stray. So you can write about your life with no problem. He was given the technique to sincerely describe his personality. As a young boy, before he developed that personality, he was given a vocabulary and a grammar of music that allowed for a compositional wandering, flirtation with other keys, meandering pseudo-modulations, but always was able to come back to uh, Marion Villardot, who was just hanging around with the kids in the kitchen, <clears throat> which would be the tonic, the key. <laughs> okay, now let's start at the beginning of this piece. Here we go. Shall we? Yes, <laughs> yes you're welcome to go to the piano, Anna. So let's hear the, uh, you, you might want to, uh, are you warmed up and tuned and everything? Yeah, you're all ready? Okay, great. Let's hear the opening of this piece from the beginning all the way until, I'll stop you, after the crash. <laughs> Give away something.
Okay, thank you, thank you. It's beautiful music, and probably you're already noticing, since you're, I hope you're listening with what we've been talking about, how it shifts into other areas away from our keys. We don't tend to listen to key the way people did in the 19th century, because we've heard so much music that's so open and does so many things. But it has moved, uh, it has seismic moves away from the key all over the place. Um, one of the most amazing moments is the crash, that, you know, the big chord, that arrival. And let's just take a look at that. Before we get there, it starts in a very orderly fashion. There's a beautiful atmosphere set up in the piano. And you probably noticed, first you have one instrument, then two, then three, and then four, but they're playing in unison. And the melody, that the, can we hear the melody without the piano for a moment? It's almost a Gregorian type modal melody. Okay, so the feeling is modal, but as it goes on, the modes change. Like, if we just play, play the next phrase, and you'll hear that the B flat becomes a B natural. I'll point it out when it happens. Okay, that, that one note changes the mode, which means that Foray can't even stay in a mode for a melody, one melody. He's got a problem. Okay, and, and then it moves with the C sharp into D minor. It has been Dorian, it has been Lydian, it has been tempting, it's been flirting with different modes without actually being clearly in a mode. Then it moves towards D minor. So you would expect there to be a big D minor cadence. Let's, let's keep going right where we left off without the piano and we'll hear the C sharp come in. Okay, so that had a C sharp and a C natural, and so, so far we've had B flat, B natural, C, and C sharp. That's important because it becomes practically a theme in the piece by itself. Now, when he finally brings the first violin and everyone else has been playing, it becomes soon after four parts, very quickly. We get to this cadence and we get a huge chord. It's our first dramatic supposed resolution. Now, can we just play that right on that chord? One after two, yeah. Okay, now with piano, right on it. Okay, now that chord, excuse me, that chord is one of the chords that if he hadn't gone to the Niedermeyer school, he would have to think of it a particular way. But because he studied at the Niedermeyer school, he doesn't have to. And this is really important because, you know, your, what you learn, your education becomes your technique at some point. And he had no other way to, I'll explain it now a little more clearly. That chord, to everybody who didn't go to the Niedermeyer school, that chord does this. It resolves like that. Always. It's called the dominant minor ninth. Not at the Niedermeyer school. At the Niedermeyer school, remember, it could be a version of, it's just a D. So, he doesn't resolve it to G minor, which is why he just doesn't. Let's hear it, see, hear what he does in, in actuality, and then I'm gonna have them resolve it to G minor so you can see what it would have sounded like had he not had this weird training and this personality. Okay. Uh, how about bar, right at bar, uh, rehearsal number two? It comes back, goes away. Okay, thank you. And it, it goes, it modulates, but it does, it's not going where it's supposed to go. Now, where does it go? Ah, no, sorry, let's play the fake version first. Yes, you're right, Anna, take that out, use it. <laughs> okay, this is, I just, you have a question? Yes. What makes it a D? What makes it a D? The big chord is the... Uh, it, it has a D in the bottom. In other words, I'll, I'll just explain that. It, it's not what's at the bottom? Well, um, the chord 
is D, F sharp, A, C, E, five. And traditionally, I mean, in all of tonal music, chords are structured in thirds, meaning skipping every other note. So it's D, F sharp, A, C, E flat. That's what that chord is. It is a D dominant ninth chord. In the Niedermeyer school, it's a D chord that has, pr has a permutation that might sound like a minor dominant minor ninth to other people. But to him, it's just a D chord. Okay, so now let's hear how it would resolve in the traditional way. <clears throat> Again. Okay, did you catch that? Let's do it again. I, I'm gonna do this as the resolution. It'll sound totally normal to you because it, this is the normal version. This is the D dominant ninth resolving the way every other composer at that time and before then would have resolved this chord. Let's do it again. Stop right there. Okay, now let's do that. That was let's just do the original now. And what he actually does is he takes that G minor chord and he flats instead of G B D G B flat D, it's G flat B flat and D flat and F flat. So it just lowered into something entirely different. Let's hear that. Hear what? Same thing. Again. Now, what he does, thank you, what he does uh, is resolve, the fake out chord resolves normally. So he went to the wrong chord and he treats that in a more normal way. So I'll sum this up one more time. This chord, instead of going here, goes, but this does resolve the way it's supposed to. All right, now, I, I have many, many places where the same kind of thing happens in this piece. I don't really have them, but I could show them to you. <laughs> um, but let's take a look at a, some more of what he's doing. The second theme, so to speak, uh, I say so to speak because it, it's almost not a theme, uh, starting at th three bars after three, after all of this, p the piano finally starts, oh, you know what, before we do that, sorry. He does finally resolve to D minor like we want him to. Finally, I, sh I should tell you that. It takes a while. So he's delaying it and delaying it by showing his Niedermeyer technique and by, on the way home, stopping off a few places. <laughs> That's basically what he's doing. So he's going from the dominant, sorry. <laughs> he's going from the dominant, he should go home. But first he goes, and then, then he goes home. That's exactly what his life was like, and he's a very sincere composer. Okay, <laughs> so let's now hear, actually, starting from two all the way to the second theme, so three after three. We're gonna hear, uh, this is how he wrote it, we're gonna hear the fake resolution, it finding its way back, and then when he finally does come to D minor. <clears throat> That sounds more normal. Not happy, but normal. Okay, now, I have a thought. Why don't we play bar measure rehearsal number two, th that bar, and go right to bar three. I'm gonna cut out all the good stuff that you just heard. I'm taking out everything except, in other words, I'm gonna remove right now the fake resolution and the detours and all the places he went. We're just gonna go from one to the, to the big resolution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he could have done that instead of what he did. It really, I don't know if we'd be playing this piece today. So you really have to thank uh, 
Marianne Viardot for putting up with all this. <coughs> okay, now let's hear this second theme. That it gets re that's that's really all it is, and then it gets stated in various ways. Could you play the opening quietly? Now it's interesting. The dynamics here are very interesting. It says fortis fortissimo espressivo, but let's hear this quietly because it's not the kind of music that is normally played like that. Doesn't it, okay. Doesn't that sound right? Yeah, but that's not what he wrote. <laughs> he wrote fortissimo. Let's play what he wrote one more time. We have to talk about this. And then, okay. So, I think it's important to look at this dynamic. We could just ignore it and say that's what he wrote, so we'll do it. Musicians often do that. They say that's what he wrote, so we'll do it. Actors never do that. <laughs> they say, why is that like that? How am I supposed to do that if I don't understand why it's like that? Will you ask, okay, no, I'm sorry, I'm not really angry with them. No, I don't know, maybe they did ask. Um, any thoughts? I have one. <laughs> A couple of thoughts. One thing I didn't mention is that when he wrote this piece, he was going deaf. And it was really, he got appointed to be the leader of the, the, the president of the Paris Conservatory the same year that his deafness had started to become an incredible problem for him, for which he didn't want anyone to know because he just became the head of the conservatory. <coughs> Not so good. Um, whether that it plays a role in this, we don't know any more than whether Beethoven's E flats in Opus 135, the press, no, can you play that? No, okay. <laughs> uh, um, whether those E flats, um, that come crashing in and die away are his ringing in his ears or not, but they might be. Now, there is definitely an inversion of dynamics here, and there also is a juxtaposition. There's this idea that it's incredibly loud, which is typically not this in style, followed by backing away and the gentle piano tune coming in. To me, if you want to investigate how it relates to his life, and I feel we have the right to do that since he himself over and over wrote that his music is a translation of his life experience, his soul, etc. That's So why we should be allowed to talk about that. Okay, good. <laughs> um, it could be that the struggle there, the volume, is about his deafness and that when it fades back, it's back into love and memory and all the better parts of his life. So it's like deafness and memory, or it's like struggle and beauty. Now there's something else in there, which is, let's just hear just the second violin, right at the second theme. Okay. Those notes are the alter, all the altered notes from the opening in a row. Now that may not be strange, but it's interesting. In other words, uh, those are the most normal notes to change. We had a B flat originally, then we had a B natural, and then we had a C sharp, which then went back to a C natural. So in a way, he's taken the entire opening theme, placed it in a concentrated way, and playing it as loud as possible with other stuff covering it up. It does seem to be perhaps about a struggle, and there's some anger here as well. Um, okay, I can't say any more about that. I mean, I could, but I'm not gonna say more. Um, now, Aaron Copland talked about Foray quite a lot. And he said two things. One of them has become very famous. He called him the Brahms of France. Not bad. I mean, he's certainly not the, um, you know, the Beethoven of France. He's not the Mozart of France. But he could be the Brahms of France. And he could be the Brahms of France in that they both were perceived of as major figures in their lifetime and were thought of as the, like the, almost like Copland was actually, kind of like the dean of, the dean of French music, the dean of German music, and the dean of American music. 
But more importantly, he said something that I really like. He said, Foray's music has an unget-addable quality. Now, if you know Copeland, that sounds it's so American. <laughs> it has that unget-addable quality, <laughs> something like that. Um, and what does that mean? Well, he's, he hints in this little article that he wrote about Foray that he's talking about the rhythm. He said, no one ever looks at Foray's rhythm. They're always thinking about how extraordinary the harmony is because it's so unbelievable. But he said the rhythm is strange too. That we're about to hear now a passage where the rhythm really is kind of odd, but you don't notice it unless you, you, you make an effort because it's not so strange for us anymore, that kind of rhythm. But it's interesting. So let's just hear everybody, uh, not, not you, just everybody here. Uh, um, let's say two beats, um, two measures before five and just keep going for a while. conducting or tapping your foot, you might have had a couple of bad moments, because <laughs> it's a little strange. Um, if you were conducting in th this ensemble and they played it, like you'd be fine, even, but you might have just done uh, this for a second, but they would have played fine without you, so that's okay. Now, let's hear just the piano uh, do, yeah, these three bars. Listen carefully, and let's, I I'll sort of conduct it when you do it. Okay, now could you maybe play it completely straight with no expression. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is listen to where the bass notes are. You can play it expressively, uh, but maybe don't retard so much because we're just concentrating on, on rhythm. Uh, listen to where the bass notes are and are not. If it's for me, I'm, I'm, I'm not here. <laughs> well, speaking, speaking of phones ringing, I got a text from my wife right before this, and this is the funniest text she's ever sent me. It said, have a good lecher. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that it's a very good one. Okay. <clears throat> now, let me, let me just go do something about that. <clears throat> I, I have to break this down. First of all, it starts like this. So we don't even get, we don't get the accompaniment in the bass. It starts off. And then it comes in there. And then, so it's in weird places. If, if you want to sound, make it sound like Stravinsky, I suppose you could. It's like, it's in strange places. <laughs> now, could you play it uh, beautifully again, which I'm not gonna do, but let's do it so that it goes one, two, three, four, five. So she's gonna play the bass notes always to feel like it's the beginning of a phrase. Okay, well, we get the idea. This is rather strange, it's in 4-4 four, four time. If you look at Foray's music, you will not find strange rhythms, you have to listen. Now, if you're a musician, looking and listening should be the same, but it's not always. Um, so, it's a very strange spot. Now, what's also strange is that he corrects it. He, he's made, there's almost a little joke here. Um, could you play the first and the third bar and leave out the second? Mm -hmm. Okay. See, now it's totally fine. 
Now just play the second and the third bar, which are the same bar. The first one has the bass notes in the wrong place, the second one has the bass notes in the right place. Now they're right. Okay, let's do that again, but I'll count. Let's see, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So the first bar is off. The second bar is identical except for the bass notes moved. That's almost Stravinsky-esque. It's almost Cubist. Now, as strange as this may seem, uh, don't forget, he lived to 1921. And as I said, he signed the diploma for Edgar Varez. I mean, the Rite of Spring is 1913. Um, Schoenberg was, con when, when this piece was written in 1905, there was quite a lot of Debussy. Um, Stravinsky was born in 1882, so he hadn't done much of anything. Um, but he was getting there. <laughs> so it's not totally strange that his music has these weird rhythms, but he was a senior citizen, so to speak, of music, who always had a way of integrating and accessing what was new around him, but without giving into trends or styles that were not really his own. He never tried anything. In fact, there was a tremendous disdain um, uh, in France at the time among the uh, major composers, and I'm including, I'm including Foray and Debussy and Ravel and these people. They had a big disdain for what they called the arriviste, the arrival person, the opportunist, you could say. But they call it the arriviste, which I think is a great word, the, because it's a, someone who's only concerned with arriving, not getting there, just arriving, not how you get there. So, in fact, I think I have some wonderful quotes about that. And this is interesting on several levels, because Faure, um was, in his music, very interested in not arriving, right? Going everywhere but where he was supposed to go. Let's see. Should do away with paper entirely. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Luckily, I memorized my favorite quote. <laughs> Debussy said, look at all these arrivistes who haven't even left yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, they use the term all the time. And um, Debussy was a great revolutionary, of course, and one of the greatest revolutionaries in the history of music. But he didn't consider himself an, an opportunist or a faddist. He created a new world because that's who he was. But there were the Debussyites. There was a huge group of people who imitated him, who worshipped him, who followed everything he did and tried to do it, and he couldn't stand these people because they were making a school out of what he was doing, and he didn't want that. And he called them arrivistes as well. Um, so back to the piece a moment. There are so many things to look at. Okay, let's take a look at starting at eight. Rehearsal number eight. Now, one of the techniques that is, is typical of Foray is it's a simple technique, but he uses it in a very personal way. You have a model and a sequence. It's a very simple thing. A model is a statement of an idea, and a sequence is taking that same thing and putting it up or down a key or a tone. So um, it could be to just demonstrate one if we, if we just do this, and then we, we go, um, that's a sequence. These are all sequences. And they're kind of Frenchy. <laughs> you notice how French music became uh, the Fantastics eventually? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, actually, French music, uh, really was at the root of a lot of popular American music. And who started that? Gershwin. That's another lecture and I already gave it. Where were you? <laughs> no, but, but um, actually it's very important. Gershwin was obsessed with Debussy, but, but also Foray. So here is a series of sequences. And what's amazing about them is that Foray sequences have these complex little worlds of, of moving parts, of everything. Um, uh, textures are rich, and then he takes the whole thing and we'll move it up a whole tone, and then up a whole tone again. That's what's about to happen. So if we start at eight. Now 
Now it goes up all tone. Now it's going to go up a whole tone, but with added music. Okay, now, okay, thank you. Um, these sequences are tricky because you're, you're not listening to the fact that it's a sequence. A huge part of this piece is sequential, meaning it's a phrase transposed, 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 then brought down, and then there's a new one, and it's, so it's over and over. One of the things that the modernist movement, which he lived through, got rid of were sequences. Because the sequences, they considered them romantic. And where they are. You know, it's, you say it, and you say it again, and you say it again, you know. As supposed to you say it. <laughs> okay, and if you weren't listening, tough. Now, what happens though, after this beautiful sequence of rising, to, going up a step and up a step, the bass appears. There's a pedal and a piano and the cello. And very slowly, it emphasizes the fact that it is now going down. Can we just um, play the, uh, from nine, but let's play the uh, bass line louder than you would do tastefully so we can hear it. <laughs> Okay, you hear that? So this bass line is descending and very slowly as the other thing was rising and then it all starts to slow, but they're all huge, huge sequences. <clears throat> now, in, in order to be able to do everything that I would like to do, I want to look at the, the very end of the piece. This is a gigantic movement, by the way. This movement is huge. And if you hear these harmonic trespasses, these flirtations with other keys, and all these sequences, it's going to make, and some of the dynamic inversions, things that you would expect not to be quite so dramatically loud, are. That's a lot. But at the very end, we have a great example of, again, his harmonic thinking. Let's, at the very end of this movement, which actually goes directly into the next. Uh, let's start at, 20, after 23, two bars. Okay, I mean, it's quite beautiful. There are a few strange moments, just a few. Let's play uh, after 23, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh, just the seventh and eighth bars. Wait, okay, let's start together. Okay, actually let's do it uh, one more time, once without the piano and once with the piano. So uh, let's listen to these harmonies, which are not, they're very foray, and by now you would say, yes, this is foray, but they're quite strange. Now they're made even more strange by the piano. Let's, let's add the piano to the same thing.
Now, I'm going to explain to you how Niedermeyer's school this is. Not that anybody else at the Niedermeyer school wrote like Foray, they didn't. But he was trained to think a certain way and he was the one who capitalized on it. Uh, not, not that it was a capitalistic situation. So first we have this. Well, I'm going to take out the cello because the cello is playing a pedal tone. Like, uh, you know, don't forget he was an organist. And a pedal tone is an organ thing. It means you leave your foot there on the pedal, you know, which you can even do on the piano, hands free, which is, uh, if you're going to play the organ, you have to do hands free notes in France at this point, it's legal. <laughs> anyway. So you can, you can do things over it while the pedal note stays there. And of course, in an organ pedal, which is where the term pedal comes from, pedal point, you leave your foot there. So we'll take that out so we can hear the harmonies. And we're getting this in the strings. I mean, this is all we need. But we're getting this. As strange as that is, if you, if you were trained at the Niedermeyer School, there's nothing strange because all you're doing is taking the note E, C, and G, and then G, C natural and E, and then you're adding the seventh, and then you're going back to the same notes and sharpening one of them. So basically, all of those are versions of, and if you add in the A that he doesn't bother with most of the time, it's in the piano sometimes. You're just making alterations. So they're all alterations of one thing, mostly just this. Now the piano, though, adds some strange things. That is taking the C sharp E G and adding a seventh. And a lower note, OK? And then he drops it here. It's still C, E, G, and he adds its seventh. Then he adds the natural seventh. So basically, he's doing it almost a Niedermeyer exercise. Different ways to hear these notes, C, E, G, B, with the pedal from the organ, and, a f and then it finally resolves. Now, I rewrote it to make it a little more ordinary sounding, but still perfectly nice. Can we hear the... Uh, non-Niedermeyer, let's say the Scola Contorum version of the ending here. That's correct. Right? See, that was completely correct. And there's nothing wrong with it, right? It's correct. It's beautiful. But it's not strange. And strangeness is an aspect of beauty, especially in romantic music. I am not the first person to say that. Uh, Walter Pater um, said exactly that. Strangeness <laughs> is an aspect of beauty. Uh, he might have said it in the other way around, that beauty needs strangeness or something, but whatever. So what, what I did there is normalize it, which I've been doing throughout. <clears throat> Now, before we hear them play this whole movement, how long is it, about 10 or 12 or something like that? Okay. I'll read you um, something Foray said when he took the job as the head of the conservatory. And by the way, there was a lot of turmoil. I mentioned already that the Scola Cantorum was kind of almost a political and moral war with the conservatory. But both of them, in fact, all three schools at first, didn't listen to, didn't let their students study some of the most important composers of the time. They didn't listen to, uh, especially at the conservatory in the Niedermeyer School, they weren't studying Wagner or Schumann or Chopin, who were very important at that time. Saint-Saëns, when he taught Foray, would, after school, he would get all his favorite students together and they'd look at a Wagner score and a Schumann score and a Chopin score. So he, he lucked out. They did study some German contemporary music, especially um, at the Schola Cantorum, but they primarily concentrated on Beethoven, actually. And what they were teaching them is the moral lessons to be found in the tones themselves. So it wasn't so helpful. Whereas at the conservatory, they, they were only allowed to use major and minor, right? They couldn't use more than four notes in a chord. He couldn't have written any of his seventh or ninth chords. 
So isn't it lucky for Ravel and Debussy and Florent Schmitt and, and um, Nadia Boulanger and all these people who got to study with Faure because he taught them the right way to, to be a musician? Um, this is what he said when he got the job. <coughs> I should like to put myself in the service of an art at once classical and modern, sacrificing neither contemporary taste to salutary traditions nor traditions to the whims of fashion. But what I advocate above all is liberalism. I would not wish to exclude any serious ideas. I'm not biased in favor of any school, and there is not a single type of music I'm inclined to ban, provided it springs from a sincere and considered doctrine. Okay, I, I have one more thing to say after we hear this. Okay, are we ready to play the entire thing? Okay, fine, entire first movement. <laughs>
Just as a teaser for next week, <clears throat> you know that Ravel, who we're looking at next week, studied with Faure, and here are just a few quotes from Ravel to pique your interest for next week. I don't particularly care about this sincerity. <laughs> I try to make art. I know that a self-conscious artist is always right. I say self-conscious and not sincere because in the latter word there is something humiliating. An artist cannot be sincere. Falsehood, taken as the power of illusion, is the only superiority of the artist over others. When one allows oneself spontaneity, one babbles and that's all. I consider sincerity to be the greatest defect in art because it excludes the possibility of choice. Art is meant to correct nature's imperfections. Art is a beautiful lie. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>